So can we do a roll call, please? You guys have a mic down there? No problem. I'm going to call the meeting to order. It's 538. And welcome, everyone. And I'm so happy to see that we have members of the public with us this evening. That's wonderful. In addition to the task force members, welcome to all of you. Thanks for taking time to be here. All right, uh, Steve Bischoff. Here. Helen Burks. Here. Marisol Cantu is absent. Okay. Uh, Eddie Chacon. Okay, Eddie Chacon is absent. Luis Chacon, I know he said he's running late, um, so I will leave him on here for now and note his arrival when he gets here. Uh, Don Gosney? Here. Randy Joseph? Is absent. All right, uh, Kristen Killian Lobos? Here. Armand Lee? Here. Leah Murray? Here. Marcus Engesing? Marcus Engesing is absent. Uh, Jamin Purcell? Here. Joey Schlemmer? Is also absent. I know he sent in an ex Excuse absent, but I will have to note for other folks. Uh, ben Terrio? Here. Deborah Small? Present. Tamisha Walker? Present. Linda Whitmore? Present. BK Williams? Here. Oh, yeah, and Lise Chacon is here now. So, all right. And with that, uh, we have a quorum present. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Very much. Next item is agenda review and adoption. Has everyone had a chance to review the agenda and does anyone have any suggested changes to the agenda as presented? Hearing none, I move that the agenda is adopted as presented. So the next item is meeting procedures. Give me one second. I will now read an announcement to the public. Anyone may make an oral comment, even if a written one has been previously submitted. However, each speaker may raise their hand once to make one public comment per agenda item. We will hold public comment very shortly after item F, city staff liaison reports. So if you would like to speak during public comment, um, just please raise your hand and then we'll note for um, when public forum arrives. Uh, for agenda items under item H, presentations, discussions, and action items, you may raise your hand during that time to provide verbal public comment for each agenda item. And we will make an announcement when it is time for public comment. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the April 26th regular task force meeting. Does anyone I'll entertain a motion unless anyone has any comments about, oh, I'm sorry. Have your hand up. Uh, I'd like to read an email into the record about the minutes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so I received an email from Leah Murray about the minutes. Uh, I was present at the last task force meeting, but I was late. I also asked a question and voted. I came in when Jesus Morales was speaking. Can you please change the minutes to reflect my presence? Thank you. Duly noted. Okay, uh, I see your hand, Steve. Second to that motion. Second. Thank you. The motion's been moved and seconded by Steve and Helen Burks. Is there any discussion? I see no hands, so I'd like to call the question. Okay. I think um, with the changes mentioned, um, Steve Bischoff? 
Helen Burks? Yes. Luis Chacon? Yes. Don Gosney? Yes. Kristen Killian Lobos? Yes. Armand Lee? Yes. Leah Murray? Yes. Jamin Purcell? Yes. Deborah Small? Yes. Ben Terrio? Yes. Tamisha Walker? Yes. Linda Whitmore? Yes. B.K. Williams? Yes. And um, Randy Solcanto is now present. Uh, vote? Okay, cool. And then the motion passes with 14 ayes, no nays, no abstentions, and five members absent. Thank you. Next item is city staff reports. Good evening, everyone. Uh, happy Wednesday to our community members as well as our task force members. So just really quickly, um, want to provide a few announcements. One is that um, there is a Caltrans Bay Area Career Fair that's happening on May 31st from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. It is in Oakland at the District 4 office and they're uh, seeking anyone who is interested in a job. If you have questions, you can call Richmond Works, which is our employment and training department, 510-307-8014. And what we're always trying to do is share information about job opportunities with our community. Um, also, this is budget season and goal setting season for our city council. So for those of you who are interested, there is a, another special meeting that is happening on Wednesday, May 31st. Is that Wednesday? I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Wednesday, May 31st is a second um, session of a special meeting series for our city council where they're doing goal setting. So they had one this Monday. They came up with six uh, high level goals and then they began to brainstorm a list of various pri uh, objective strategies within each of those goals. And so there will be a follow up meeting to that on Wednesday and that'll be from 4 to 7 p.m. in this room. If people are interested, it will be taped but not broadcast live. And then of course, there is the city council meetings. The next one is June 6th. This is budget season. So if you're interested in learning more about what's happening with the city budget, um, please join us at those different meetings. There's one on June 6th, and then another one on June 20th, and then June 27th for the month of June. And for city council, it is their job to adopt a balanced budget before July 1st, which is the beginning of our new fiscal year. With that, unless our Thank you, Heather. Welcome back. <laughs> um, she's helping us out in the city attorney's office. This is our attorney for today. Allison couldn't be here. Stephanie, anything? No. Nope. That concludes my our announcements for staff reports. Thank you very much. This one is very confusing. No, it just, it, the light doesn't come on. Anyway, next item on the agenda is public comments. All right, if anybody would like to make a co public comment on an item that is not on the agenda, you may raise your hand now and you will have two minutes to speak. Anybody? Ch Chair Small? <laughs> no other hand. Hi, Marisol Kintu for the record. Um, just want to comment on the city staff reports and the Monday's priority budget meeting. I had noticed that it was in the middle of the day, which is very, really difficult for a lot of our community members to attend. I encourage people in the afternoon, next Wednesday, if you're available in the evening, to please go. I also um, had noticed that the CCRP hadn't been a top priority originally put up for the, uh, by the per the consultant and so I just want to encourage our task force as we have been trying to move the CCRP along to make sure that our city council members um, are advocating for the budget to be prioritized and CCRP to be prioritized thank you Thank you, Marisol. So actually my public comment really has nothing to do with the task force. It's a comment about art. And I just wanted to mention to people if they hadn't seen it already, 
about the uh, Kehinde Wiley exhibit that's currently um, at the De Young Museum. Um, for those who don't know, Kehinde Wiley is an amazing, an amazing um, African-American artist. He's the artist who painted the portrait of um, Barack Obama. That was his official portrait. And there's a special um, exhibit of his work that's currently um, at the De Young, and it'll be there throughout the summer. And the reason I'm mentioning it here is because it's free for Bay Area residents on Saturdays, which I think is amazing. So I feel like it's an important thing for people to know, to have an opportunity to see. Um, it's called The Architecture of Sorrow, and uh, it's amazing. So that's my public comment. Any other public comments? All right, we're good. Next agenda item is presentations, discussions, and action items. First one is to receive an update from Safe Organized Spaces Richmond on unhoused interventions. And I believe I see Daniel Barth here. Um, are you the person who's going to be presenting um, on SOS? Our team is presenting. Okay, great. So I'll leave it to you all. Hey. Welcome. Hello, everybody. I'm O'Neill Fernandez. I'm a health ambassador with Lifelong and a lead of outreach for SOS. I have five years lived experience from encampments from El Sobrani, North Richmond, from tents, cars, um, everything. I'm now 16 months sober and have, thank you, and have put a roof over my, me and my family's uh, heads, you know, a, a nice bed, a warm bed, um, changed my life totally. Uh, from what it was 16 months ago to what I've become and had progressed into this beautiful career that I have in outreach now. Um, on our pictures here, we want to point out our, our, our beautiful rock star, Bree. She's also an, uh, in, an encampment, Castro encampment resident, or I should say ex encampment resident. She's progressed uh, into her own apartment. She started with us uh, as a as a steward cleaning up trash in, in the encampment that she lived at. Then she, she now has progressed beautifully into training as a insurance agent and seems to be progressing beautiful in life. And I just want us to, we have a bunch of young gentlemen here. We have the health ambassadors, I'm sorry, youth ambassadors with us. We've done a lot of beautiful things from outreach and all these other things. I'm Daniel Barth, and I'm the executive director of SOS. And what I'd like to be instead today is, if you may, the weaver of context, because an executive director presumes that there is you know, this, this structure and this expectation that is like corporatized, and, and that's what we need to be, right? There needs to be someone who brings home the bacon, right? Gets us paid every Wednesday, which we do, we have a payroll of almost $10,000 a week because we employ up to 30 individuals. So I want to talk about our mission, but I want to talk it in the context of why we're here. We're here because we've got a, a wicked problem. We need solutions to homelessness for sure. But we're not getting there by providing solutions. We're getting there by empowering individuals. And so here is an organization that is coming up that you have helped to make happen. You have leveraged the ability for SOS Richmond to become where we are today. 18 months later, we want to give you a report back about what we've done over the, for, over the last 18 months since we started in October of 2021. And now, as an independent nonprofit organization and with our, our, our new leaders coming in from our management level staff. Uh, Tommy is here as our director of operations. I want to introduce each of us in the context of why we're doing this work. Because we can bring real solutions to homelessness. 
we can. People say it's impossible, that the scale is too, too uh, it outmatches, the, the need outmatches any ability to do something. And we can talk about outreach, encampment services, the jobs that we provide, and the safe living spaces that we want to create. But you cannot create that in a vacuum. What has to be created is a community of care, a community that doesn't act like the homeless industrial complex that is seeking to you know, build itself for its own purpose. That is not what we're here for. We are here for equity empowerment. Equity empowerment understands that every single one of us has those abilities in ourselves. And we may have been ripped from that. We may have been dispossessed from our innate root nature. Or we may have lost the family that we have had. We have family, strong family members, but we do not have the wholeness that brings us to a sense of home. So what are we trying to do? And I, I love uh, I love that uh, O'Neill is starting us off because O'Neill comes here. The reason why he's such a great outreach worker and really what he's got, I don't want to put a halo on that head, but what he's got is a director of programs in him. One year, a little more than one year in this organization and he has taken it, taken it by the, the scruff of the neck and lifted it up. And the reason he can do that is because he's got a natural ability. He, he's Hawaiian and he's got this sense of his aloha spirit, and he builds a sense of ohana, family. And what do we need when we lack place, when we lack purpose, when we lack the ability to move forward? We need hope, but you don't find that ourselves. In a crisis, we cannot do that ourselves, and I'm preaching to the choir. I understand that, but I'm weaving context here. It's not just about what we delivered. Oh, we delivered some trash to the dump. That's not what this is about. This is about building family, and this is what we have here. I want to introduce you, because they're not, to, the, uh, to, to these fine individuals, they're going to be too humble to actually speak about where they're coming from in the full extent. But we can see it. Look, Joel has been with us for just about a month, maybe a little more than a month, and what he brings is this spirit of I want a job, and I'm going to show up every single day. I'm going to come to our staff meeting. We have one every single day, 9 o'clock. You're welcome to join and be there, just like Ann did. Where is Ann? Ann Jenks. She stepped up. Okay, so she did a presentation, and we did surveys for the, uh, for the, um, uh, the CCRP, and we had a, a vibrant discussion, which you'll see a photo at the end. And the point is, she joined our family. She joined our family and in the process is beginning to link what Kristen and I are going to do, or, or, and CCRP in general, is the, the building of this community of care. It's not just about CCRP doing its job. It's not just about SOS doing its job, delivering jobs and outreach and encampment services. It's about building this community of care. And it starts with a family of our own, Ohana. And, it's, and, it, and it continues when we have the opportunity of what, I would, what we can call the principle of Sankofa. Sankofa in Ghana talks about how if we've been dispossessed of our innate abilities and we've been stripped away, like taken away from the, from the lives that we could have had or had, we need to find our roots, build that back up in the spirit of Sankofa. So with that spirit, in that principle, that guiding principle that we can call our own at SOS, we don't have our values and all of that laid out in a beautiful you know, website yet. But what we have are in the human form right here. So I spoke about Joel. He showed up every single day and he said, knock, 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 you're gonna give me a job. He didn't say that, he just showed that by showing up every single day. And again, I don't wanna preach, I'm just telling you who these individuals are. And then when Michael shows up, Michael shows up wanting to do something and taking it. And, and we know that, you know, I know, I don't know Michael at much at all because he's been here with, for less than a month. We barely ever met. But what I do know is I know your mom is a strong mom. Right? And your mom could have been a staff of us, but as a volunteer at the Castor Encampment, your mom ran the show as a human being to other human beings, just like we want to do brother to brother, brother to sister, and I know that you're a chip off of that. So why not hire you and build 
you as a leader. And you're, it's not going to be that, that this organization builds it. It's going to be that you have the opportunity to build it in yourself. And so beyond the spirit of family, beyond the spirit of reclaiming our lost heritage, we have the empowerment, the equity that we can build within ourselves to rise to where we want to go. When we talk about Bernard DeAndre, the professor, Flea, we call him, Flea is his street name. Now Flea, the professor, is coming to his own, into his own almost uh, 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 at being here only for a year as well, a little more than a year. And what he's risen to do is to, is to own his strength. His strength is he knows everyone. He, just, just like this dude, he knows everyone out there. They're all like family, and some of them are. And so if it's, we gotta, we gotta walk into neighborhoods where none of us feel trusted. You know, they don't know, folks don't trust most of us, but when we've got the right ingredient, and the professor's got that ingredient a lot of the time, then we're creating relationship where relationship wouldn't have been created. You ain't solving something if you don't even have relationship. You can't get to family if you don't create that trust. And that's what we have as experts. That's why he's the professor. Right now, they're gonna try, and this is gonna be a first time of presentation. And the most important thing is I can say, talk next. Uh, talk next, Joel, that you're next on because I don't have to do all the speaking. I can shut up because you don't want to hear from me. You want to understand that the proof of concept of SOS is in the embodiment right here. And giving them a chance to speak and give this presentation is what we're here to do today. So if we sh talk about the last 18 months and our future 12 months and hopefully way beyond there, the capacity that we can reach, the deepening of our services, the expansion and scaling of our reach. That's what we seek to do. And we can't do it by ourselves. We're doing it working together. That's our tagline, neighbors working together, housed and unhoused neighbors working together on outreach. These are our four strategies that we're gonna to talk to you about. Outreach, encampment services, jobs, and safe li living spaces. And the solution is in the engagement and the relationship, Ohana, and in the family that we create by building trust one minute at a time. So after only one month, they're gonna be talking. So let's go to the next slide, please. Right, who's got this one? We rehearsed, we rehearsed once. So. Who's got this one? Oh, was that, was that? Uh, oh, so Junior, Salvador. Let me talk about Salvador. Another strong mom birthed him. And he is, and she was also a member of the Castro encampment. And that Castro encampment, which is being resolved, and that community is being dispersed, all the bad of it and, and all the good of it, is going to, and folks are going to go into their own places. So it's important that when someone like Junior Salvador is called to us to have a job and only has been working with us for one month as well, that we embrace him. Even though he lives in two worlds, he is afraid of showing himself. And he would wear a mask if he were here, not for COVID, but to preserve the fact that he's got to live the life out there and also wants to show up here. So how do we get folks who've been possessed by other forces to be re brought back to what is possible in, in Salvador's life? So anyway, he was going to talk about this, so I'll have to just talk for another minute, I guess, 30 seconds. This is what we're going to cover. In part one, we're going to look back at what we've done. And then in part two, we're going to look at what it is that we're shooting for and where we are walking today. And then we're going to talk about those four strategies. Next slide, please. Yes. Oh, who's got it? OK. Hi, my name is Menard. Um, everybody called me Flea out here in Richmond. I'm, I'm born and raised out here, you know, I've been in the, I've been homeless for a majority of my life, you know, I've been in Castro for the last two years now, you know, I've been, I've been around. And I would like to thank the services of SOS for helping me out, you know, because they gave me a chance to rebuild myself and really see myself. And I would just like to say for the next, you know, over the next 18 months, the things that we would like to see and do 
you know, is, is we like to help, help other people that, that need help. That's, that's one of my things that I want to do because they gave me a chance and I would like to give a chance back to them. And I would like the services that we, that we provide is like, we do showers, you know, they, we, we bring food to the, to the ones that don't have food, you know, we help them with, with different things like um, healthcare. I mean, we have, we have Lifelong over here, you know, to help with the, with the services that they need bandages, we have them, for, we have lifelong to help them with that. You know, if they need medical, if they need like the SSI, the, SS, the Social Security card, ID, we have the vouchers to help them out. You know, we have different resources to help them out with, with everything they need, with homeless, if they need somewhere to stay, we have, we have places they can go. If they need help with anything throughout the night, we have a person they can call to help them out throughout the night, you know what I'm saying? He volunteered himself to do this and he does this every day and every night, every day and every night, you know. And I would like to thank them for that. And and it's a workforce that 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 is very powerful, you know, because they gave me a chance straight. And I can't lie, I'm I. They gave me a chance straight out of jail, you know. And this is like the only organization I ever did that, and I really appreciate it for all that. I really changed my life around being with them. I haven't committed any crime, I haven't been back to jail. You know, I've, I've been doing very bad. I'm not homeless no more. I have a roof over my head now. I have my own apartment now, I'm paying rent, paying bills. I'm, new, I'm, I'm a new member of society because of them. And I thank them for that, you know. And with that, with that, with that being said, you know. <laughs> with, that, with that being said, you know, I, I really would like to, um, we have an outreach program that, that I'm part of, you know, and I like to go into a different encampment now and tell them my story, you know, and, and hopefully inspire them to, 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 to want to do better. You know I mean, it's a lot of people that, that, that see me, you know, and want to do what I do. So I try to bring them out and, and we didn't got people IDs, we didn't got people their social security cards, we didn't got people jobs, you know, we didn't did a lot, for, and, I, and it's it's just building and building. Now, hopefully, over the next 18 months, we can we can continue to do this and continue to go and continue to strive. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joel. I'm 29 years old, and um, well. I came back to the U.S. about eight months ago uh, to support my wife and my newborn baby. Uh, but uh, I somehow became, became homeless ever since then uh, and ended up uh, by the train tracks behind the SOS yard. But thanks to, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> thanks to SOS, I now have a job. Mm where I can send money to my wife every week. Uh, I get to take a shower, you know, do my personal hygiene, um, my laundry, stuff like that. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I, I just want to thank them for everything that they were giving me lately. Yeah, you know, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, some of our success measures, um, I mean, there's a thousand things we could measure from our success, from everyone you just heard from. Um, we are all our own success stories. And I'm, I know, I mean, most of us wouldn't be where we're at without the start of the, like he said, the family of SOS. I know I wouldn't, I'm not from out here. This is my family. This is who I enjoy to spend my day with. You know, so some of our, our, our our success is, you know, with 540 tons of trash removed, over 3,000 showers, uh, 27 employees moved into housing, 19 average hours work per week, 23,000 hours work by unhoused employees, 30% increase in new funding, 27 unhoused neighbors employed, 3,800 uh, water gallons delivered per month, 
150 laundry participants per month and 10 portable toilets at, at, at encampments. Next slide. So, so what we've got are those n measures that we just talked about for the last 18 months, that's what we've been gradually building up so that instead of picking up one ton of trash per week, it's sometimes got to be 45 tons of trash in that week. So those same measures are gonna count in, in 23, 24, but we're also gonna try to, jet, to, to understand how many months in work experience, and I'm gonna talk about how that new funding stream is gonna be available in work experience and employment. How long does it take to folks to graduate to the next level? How, much, how many employees get into new jobs? And also at the bottom there, how many non-employees secure entitlement incomes, medical jobs, uh, interim housing, permanent housing, so it's the outreach that's getting other individuals supported because when we are lifting ourselves up through the equity empowerment model and we do so collectively, we're doing so with others as well because that's the mission of our work, is that we're not only delivering services, but we're helping individuals to change their life situations. So will we have a lot of outreach contacts every month? Absolutely, and how many? And then are we going to be helping people improve their health, income, and housing, the overall encounters, because we need to make repeated encounters with individuals. We need to shuttle them to the basic services that they need to get. We need to shuttle them to community services and resources. We need to engage them in a personal vision curriculum that was created mostly by Tomi and now is being spearheaded by O'Neill. And so we have this eight-week curriculum that we're gonna be hopefully uh, well, we've been piloting and now we have trained a facilitator and now it's going to be put on blast. We're going to be doing that in community starting at one location and hopefully going in several locations neighborhood by neighborhood. Uh, are we going to do care management? We just had a conversation and the answer to Leah is yes. And, and so those are the measures that we would like to see happening starting now and now we need to build the systems to track that. Because we don't show you all the numbers all the time means that maybe people have distrust whether we're doing work. But believe you me, we're out there seven days a week. We start at nine, we end at five. Sometimes, like we heard, we're getting calls at two in the morning. If we get a council member calling us about what's going on at Fifth and Bissell, we're gonna be there to see what's going on. And then we're gonna have Flea showing up, talking to his cousin, because that's what we've got to do. Can we measure all that? We're gonna do our best. Next slide. Hello. Hello. My name is Michael. I'm 22 years old. I've been homeless for, I say, about a year now. Uh, I'm living with my mom. I've been working with SOS for about a month, and I guess they helped me with staying out the streets, staying away from basically all the negativity. I'm able to keep myself busy at all times, and uh, have money to help my mom. Here, this is some of our SOS workers, not all of them, since this is an old picture. Hopefully we're able to retake it. But yeah, as, we, as you can see, we start them off young. <laughs> Next slide. So, what I want to say about this, one of the beautiful things of working with SOS, I'm not going to go through each one, every one of them, I mean, but is that we got to create our, what we wanted to create. You know, we all started in one area. We've got to build our, our laundry. We did that. No one else told us what we're going to do. We figured these things out. We wanted to do the water. We figured out how to do the water. You know, there was no, the, the, there was nobody above going, this is what you have to do. This is how you have to do it. We all had a say on how we're gonna create these different opportunities um, that some of us are benefiting off of, you know, um, still benefiting off of and, and, and continue to. So that's, you know, that's a, that's a huge thing for us. I mean, to come from the street and get told, hey, how do you wanna do this? I wanna do it like this. This sounds, you know, let's figure this out. And we gotta create so many different things with 
that opportunity. And you know, our diversity, I mean, we got diversity right here. You know, I mean, Pacific Islands all the way to, you know, around the world. You know, we're not lacking of that at all. One of the cool things is, is our, the pay rate. I mean, from, from our, 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 our least paid to our highest paid, it's not that much different. It's not, you know, it's nowhere near what we're seeing at other organizations where their executive directors are driving in with their, their Porsche or whatever they're driving in and we're all walking or taking the bus to work. You know, so, and to be able to be paid at a rate of $18 an hour, that's a pretty good start when you're coming from the streets and, you know, you're, you're not just being said, here's a minimum wage job. Here's a job that you can maybe get yourself out of it into a better situation, have a little ch pocket change. So, I guess next slide. Like I said, I got to bring, I got to bring home the bacon. We got to, we got to fuel this engine that keeps on getting a V8, and we now need to drive a trailer behind it, and it's full of water, and that means it needs to have fuel, and that fuel, thank goodness, we got a second. Uh, shot of life from the city. Uh, we got three quarters of a million, and we, we matched that with uh, the 229 of that 300,000 that we've raised in the first 18 months. We're now taking into year two. Uh, but here's what I want to mention is I just finally had a conversation with, uh, we had a conversation with the folks at YouthWorks and with uh, Tamara over, over all of ENT uh, employment and training. And so what we're expecting is that we're gonna be bringing in an income, let's quote in quotes, by having a work experience program that's gonna, instead of us hiring, you know, when, when someone walks in the door and wants that job, we say, okay, well, let's fill it out. Let's fill out the paperwork and you're on. But instead now, they're gonna walk into youth works if they're under 30, they're gonna walk into Richmond works if they're over 30, and they're gonna start work experience. And that work experience is gonna be paid for by institutional sources. It doesn't have to come from the city itself. This is the matching that we wanna make. That after that 500 hours, they're gonna be on on-the-job training. Right? And that on-the-job training is gonna allow for those institutional sources beyond the city to pay for at least 50% of that salary, of not salary, of that hourly work. And so hopefully what we're gonna see is by the end of this year, if we can realize this partnership with the city of Richmond ENT, is that we're gonna be pulling in an extra whole pot of money so that we can continue to scale our services. And, 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 and thanks to the city council, eventually administration is gonna catch up with the council, is that we're gonna then get money for a fund development manager so that we can actually do the fundraising that we need to do so that when Tamara is doing that great grant writing that we're showing up with our grant writer and it's a true partnership a true equal partnership we're the intermediary we're the ones convening the 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 actual work of improving our outreach by reaching into communities and delivering them to the career services that Richmond works and and youth works provide so i'm looking forward to that as our fiscal next step in 2023-24. Next slide. So with uh, the things we, we, we would like to do, I mean, yes, we're Richmond based, but there's a whole lot of more homeless that's surrounding us that there's not many, you know, there's, there's different outreach teams, core and all, but, we're out there seven days a week. We're picking up the trash seven days a week. I mean, we're one of the only ones that I know of that are out there seven days a week, you know, responding to calls all night. Doesn't matter, they call, I pick it up. You know, so it, it, we want to expand. You know, we're already doing a huge number from El Sobrani, Point Richmond, Central, all of, out, uh, all of the Richmond, greater Richmond area, we would like to expand from here to Crockett, you know, get into El Cerrito, get into different areas. Um, with the outreach, we're able to do some of that. Now that I'm employed by Lifelong, I'm able to go to those surrounding areas and, 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 and introduce our outreach to them. Bring, you know, help them not just get the medical, but let them know, hey, we give showers. You need a shower? We're only a town away. We can, you know, we're not far. 
You need some laundry? We do a laundry service. We're not far away. This is where we're at. So we're able, we really would love to expand from here to Crockett. Like I said, El Cerrito in the hills. I mean, there's 1,000, 2,000 homeless surrounding us within a 10-mile radius. You know, so we would like to get there from here to Timbuktu if we can. But <laughs> next slide. Our first strategy, well, our first of our, our four strategies is outreach. Um, we, have, we have a number of different outreach. We are building a whole different approach. We just started the outreach mm, six months ago when I was the only person we were doing the outreach. Now we have Flea stepping up to the plate, who is a rock star out there. We have a second health ambassador. Uh, we have a, a, a four, so we basically have a four team um, outreach team, you know, went from one and we've just, these guys are just knocking out of the park. One after another, we go in our neighborhood care line. As I said, that number comes directly to my phone. I don't miss the call. If I'm sleeping, I wake up because it may be a response that no one else is going to respond to. You know, so we're, we're, I'm very vigilant about answering that phone, sending our team out the next day getting a response. We have a crisis intervention. We have our regular contacts and trust building, our well-being assessments, our income, health, and housing goals, our personal vision, vision curriculum, which like I think Daniel had said, um, Flea was amazing. That's where I was like, oh, we need to bring him in outreach. He did this curriculum. I was blown away by Flea walking in and he was into it, into it every day, pouring his heart out for eight weeks straight. You know, it was beautiful. Now we have our workforce pipeline. 30 something of our employees are from the unhoused. We're, we want to create more of those workforce that work and get people into better jobs, like lifelong, into different avenues, getting them other trainings, finding out these other ways of doing that. Next. Okay, well. The, our second strategy is, is, is basically is, is the encampment services. You know, we would like to get to each and every one of these encampments. You know, we as we as you can see, we got to we're in Pano, San Pablo, Hilltop, um, the surrounding areas of the Iron Triangle. We're trying to get as far out as possible as we can. You know, to help people with showers. You know, we do we do the laundry services and we pick people up, take them back. And we also pay for it, you know, so they don't have to pay, they don't have to come out of their pocket to pay for no for nothing. We pay for that too. You know, we, we provide everything that they basically need and we just want to help each and every person as possible. I'm part of, I'm part as, as, as in this organization, I'm part of like every step of it. I'm, I do shower power, I do outreach, you know, I'm part of the streets team. Um, I, I pretty much, they put, pretty much put me in each and every field possible and I don't mind it, not one bit. It, it helps me out, it keeps me, it keeps me straight, on the straight and narrow path, you know, and, and I'm loving it, I'm loving it. I love being part of the streets team, you know, I love being part of the shower power, you know, because I get to meet each and every one of these individuals and talk to them and share my experience, share everything with them and help them out with whatever they need. We give them, we have, we have clothing for them if they need clothing that we get donated to us, you know, food that get donated to us, we, we help with meals and things. And we're basically, you know, a tight family. And you know, it takes a village to raise one. So we are a village trying to raise everybody and trying to help and uplift everybody. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, well, I, then I end up getting all the last three. We don't want to do that. <laughs> so job strategy, uh, our strategy number th three is our jobs. Uh, our workforce empowerment, our local stewards, our team members, team leaders, and graduate to full-time job, job outside of SOS. So one of the beautiful things is when they come in, and they said they may be changing, now they have to go to Richmond Works. But normally as it's been happening is we 
hire you. You come in, you come to our staff meeting, we welcome you in. You know, a couple of us will say, yes, this guy, let's try him out. You get our local storage, they start out with nine hours a week. You know, and usually they're identified to, hey, you're in that accountant, great, now we have a steward here. We got a steward there, you know, I mean, Joel was a steward, I was a steward, he was a steward. We all started out with this nine hour, uh, nine hours a week, which is great. When you have zero to nine hours, it's nice to get that little paycheck. You know, it's nice to have, once you get the nine hours, you, say, you want a shower? When you're done with that, those three hours that day, come on down, take a shower. You want a hot cup of coffee? We got an office, you're welcome. You're a part of our staff, part of our family. Then we have our team members, our, our shower power team members, you know, they get a run, they get more of their set, a little more hours. They're the ones that are in our trucks, doing the, the, the showers, doing our trash pickups, doing our outreach, doing our laundry. Um, our team leaders, who are the ones who are helping supervise what's going on, making sure the time cards are put in correctly, you know, getting direction from whomever is, is sending that complaint or that trash pickup, we're responding to our team leaders. And then our graduate to full-time jobs outside SOS, and I think I said this before, I, lifelong, I went from SOS, and now I have a full-time job with lifelong. And that's what we'd want to see from everybody in our staff. We're a stepping stone to that next, that progression in life and trying to get a better job. And the fourth strategy is the, the most difficult. Can we work in encampments? Yes. Can we deliver those basic safety net services? Is that enough? Absolutely not. Equity empowerment is not about delivering patriarchal type services where here, let's give it all to you. No, it's about creating environments like a family that SOS has and doing so in the communities that we need to develop beyond the existing encampments. Can we settle encampments? Can, set, can encampments remain somewhat supported with those basic services and sustain itself? No, because it's not just Richmond, it's every jurisdiction and the special districts are going to abate people out of their what they call home. And so we can, we can support encampments, we can keep them settled, but they don't stay settled. Every unsupported encampment, every encampment that is not fully sanctioned and supported will fail, period. So what we need to do is to continue to do our outreach, create alternative spaces, because the county doesn't have the resource to be able to get folks into shelter, into interim housing, just like that. So can we create emergency safe spaces? We can. And we've, with community support, get folks from, I was just in front of the Trader Joe's where there was someone who was sitting on that bench for years, for years. And I go, I go look at that bench every day when I walk by, when I pick up my kid going to, you know, their, their music class, and I say, that, that bench is empty today. Oh, look, there's a shopper sitting at that bench not Jane sleeping at it. And we can do that 10, 15, 20, 30 times. People might complain. I, I hear a council member saying, we need to do things in the hundreds, but we gotta do things like Flea said. It's that one, community supporting that one. And that's what we're gonna continue to do. Those safe space units are what we need to develop in SRO units. And, and, and then the, the funding sources then support people who we've initially put into those safe space units. And it's happening right now. Initially, we get folks in the door, they are settled in the unit, and then the existing resources now can hopefully sustain with a subsidy that person in that unit. Can we create micro villages? Well, we're seeing it. You're gonna, you're gonna hear more about uh, what's going on in front of our pal, next to our pal in front of GRIP. There's gonna be tiny home, uh, a, a tiny home village pilot. The, one of the reasons why we're bringing in the young folks, the young, uh, the young leaders, is that we need leadership to run that. Because who's gonna run that? We are, because we have a sense of purpose that can extend beyond the few hours of being a local steward. We can make it a 24 seven, just like O'Neill is doing, being part of a micro village. Do, can we build empowerment villages? Yes, we just went out with a delegation of Richmond uh, uh, leaders to look at model uh, villages, and we're trying to replicate that and bring it to our West County. And can we, of course, support people into permanent housing? There's a long road to get folks into that housing, but we need to start by working with people where they're at. 
And that's our strategy towards getting to operating safe living spaces, is that what we do remotely, we can bring to a living environment. And it starts with building that sense of community. Last slide. And sorry if we went a little bit over. So in summary, there we are actually in our staff meeting uh, talking with Anne uh, about the CCRP. Every week we try to, be, every two weeks we have a big, a larger staff meeting where we try to take care of some serious business and, um, and otherwise we're just planning for the next day, the next week. Those are all empowered actions that we're planning. They are constituent design. We are evolving from that safety net to building a sense of equity, not a sense of equity, real actual equity where we're putting it in our pockets. Uh, in 20 months, we have shaped an organization. 20 months is not a long time. We've done a whole lot and we want to ask you if you feel after hearing this and asking qu us questions and answering your true uh, critical feedback about SOS Richmond, are we shaping as an organization that's worthy of being a, uh, a model, a uh, proven concept, and, and I would like to challenge you to challenge us so that we can continue to deepen and scale. And now we'll take some questions, and we thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, all of the team from SOS. It's been wonderful having you here. And I personally really appreciated hearing from each of you um, your experiences um, and the ways in which that this program is supporting you in reaching some of your life goals. So now I wanna open it up for questions from the task force and then after that we'll take public uh, comments and questions. So any task force members that have questions, please raise your hand. Go ahead, Helen. Uh, I have a couple small questions and then a big one. If I can ask the crowd, I'll go quickly. Um, you mentioned on one of the slides, it said that there was 19 hours average in the week. I know when you went to the employment, uh, O'Neill, you were going over that different team members. All right, can you give us a report of like how many people you have at each of those different positions? So. So for instance, how many stewards, how many team members, how many, I think, and I'll say the question and then I'll just, uh, I'll put a kind of wondering with it. Um, what's clear to me from the presentation is the personal impact. That was awesome. What I'm less clear on is some of the financial, the use of funds. So that's some of the data that I didn't see in the presentation. And so that's kind of my push and that, if it's not you, whoever should <laughs> respond about, um, how many employees you have at each of the different levels at this time? So uh, our base rate is, is 18. So everybody starts off at 18. Um, and this is obviously, I don't have those numbers exactly, but roughly we have in six, maybe seven local stewards, uh, roughly six or seven local stewards. Um, we have, like I said, four outreach. Um, and each one of the, each one of our areas we have a team leader who is paid at a higher rate so from from 18 1950 and 21 um, and then that we have like our logistics manager um, so showers have have a two to three people on for each sh shift which is four days a week we have two people doing water um, three to four people doing our trash uh, that our mobile trash, we have three days a week, well actually three days a week we have a team of four at Castro that actually clean up, they don't, you know, that is their base, that's where they clean up at. We also have a couple of, I don't wanna call them stragglers, but other days that we're cleaning communities up, which is from the Castro encampment. So the Castro people, some of them work three, some of them work, work I believe four and five, um, at four to four to three hours. So the 19 hours was just uh, an average from our 30, 40 hour guys down to our nine, nine was the average between uh, all the hours. Yeah, I think that makes sense breaking it down. I think something that I just ask um, for, for Daniel is 
we really need a greater focus on how the money was spent i understand that there's some things that can't be quantified and that i feel like you guys communicated really well today um this is really crazy i'm sorry i'm like trying i like feel like i'm screaming in your ears um what I'm trying to say is that the impact, especially that the four of you shared, that was powerful. This is, I know it's supposed to be questions. I'm gonna lead, lead into a question. The preamble, this is my honest feedback, Daniel, we didn't need that. Um, that context weaving felt like it was trying to caution against something we weren't gonna see, you know what I mean? And it felt like a disclaimer in a way that almost felt not authentic to the true power that's happening in individual lives transformations. So that's, that's my feedback, that's my opinion. What I think, like it's clear to me that you're doing good work. What I'm unclear about is if you're doing the work that you committed to do with the funds that we gave because I don't see how the funds were used from this presentation. So am I doubting that good work is happening? No. Like that's, that's not where I'm living in my questions. But there were some specific things that, the com that your group committed to with the funds that we gave, some of which, for instance, the safe spaces, the tiny villages. And I don't see, this is what we did with the money. And it felt like an ask for more money. And I, the group growing, for instance, beyond Richmond, like that's not the purview of this task force. So I felt like some of the presentation wasn't aligned with what we were expecting from the presentation, if that makes sense. Yeah, maybe we can back up one slide or two if we can, to what we said that we were going to deliver. Can back one the other way? There. OK, so no, that's it. So the six objectives that we said that we were going to, that we, the contract said that we need to address mm -hmm. is to clean up trash, the mobile showers, deploy those encampment services. M many of those we did. Some of those, like wastewater disposal and, and solar power, we didn't, it's an unfinished mm -hmm. business developing those systems. That's a work in progress. Developing the workforce and the leadership from the ground up, that's what we've been doing. Responding to local situations with outreach and problem solving, that's the development of our outreach, which has resulted in those uh, increased requests to respond to problems, our increased cooperation. This is not answering your, your question about numbers but it's answering the question about what is it that we said we were going to, that the contract said we were going to do. Mm -hmm. Increased cooperation is what we developed by building new so relationships. Can I, can I ask you to sure. dig into the safe living spaces specifically? Because well, sure. that's the one that I haven't seen a report out on exactly what you've done. I saw an intention moving forward, and I'll be real like transparent and say, if it didn't happen, it's okay to say this didn't happen, and here's why. Right? I just want us to like have it out on the table. We're not trying to sit here and need to frame it a certain way. You get what I'm saying? Well, like, course, I, I know even course. from beyond this presentation, I've heard from community members about the power you're doing. So for me, that's not the question. Does, does that make of sense? Of course. So that last objective, while it was in our contract, there was pushback from members of, of city administration uh, to not, that was not an eligible activity. So when we were developing our safe, spa our scattered sites program, mm -hmm. what, some of what we were doing was not in the eligible activities. Now this is something Marisol, you brought up and been very plain about. It's not in the scope of the contract. It was not was the original intent of this task force. It was in there to develop these, and we sought to do that in the back in the parking lot of churches. Mm -hmm. And it's been a very difficult situation. We hired a, a professional. Donnell Jones is, knows how to build community amongst the congregations, and we were unsuccessful with that expertise in doing that. Mm -hmm. It's a work in progress because people don't want to have in their parking lot, let alone in their neighborhood, of course, mm -hmm. uh, sanctioned safe living spaces. It's a work in progress, and in 20 months, we've gotten closer. And that's why I'm pointing out that the, the, the RPAL project with the Police Activities League is a consequence of our steady discussion about this since 2017. In the beginning, when we came to the Homeless Task Force and we brought up the notion of safe living spaces and we th talked about transitional villages, there was no mm -hmm. conversation to move that forward. Uh, when I talked to Larry Lewis, the ED of, of our pal, five years ago about that piece of land at 22nd and Bissell, mm -hmm. there was no interest in doing what now he has initiated. 
And now we have been the intermediary to then get folks to the table, including the, uh, the, the organization that's going to design this program, mm -hmm. uh, Youth Spirit Artworks. The organization that's going to develop this program, Rebuilding Together, who's been our fiscal sponsor. Okay. Uh, and, and, and then other resources to make that project happen. So it's been a work in progress. Yeah, I guess my, my feedback, and I'm going to let someone else talk because I know I'm hogging the mic, is that I felt like this presentation was a this is what all of our organization does. And what I know I anticipated from today is like this is the specific outcome of some of the money you gave and what it was used for. So like some of the questions I have is like how much of the money specifically went to um, unhoused individuals for work? Is that 90% of your funding? Is it 60%? Because I want to know, I'm glad that you're empowering individuals. I want to know that the money's getting in their pocket. And I, I hear that you're getting paid, so that's great. But you get what I'm saying? Like we have to hold people that we give money to accountable so that we have some report on where each of the piece of monies are going. Because y'all be surprised with organizations sometimes how that money goes before it gets to people. And I'm not accusing you of that, but that's why we need a little more transparency. Is my I want to thank you first for your presentation. Uh, I do agree with Helen. I'm sorry. Did you raise oh, your hand? Oh, I'm sorry. You I, the mic. I'm sorry. I did raise my hand. Okay, I didn't and see I, you, but didn't came. have the opportunity sorry. to recognize you. I'm sorry, the mic came. I went. I thought I would recognize. Sorry. Okay, go ahead, Linda. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank you for your presentation. I have to agree with Helen. I really would want, like, to have to have you give us a, a breakdown for the monetary expenses for different things. You mentioned $10,000 a week for, I think, a week for salaries. It would be nice to have seen how you're paying the number of people who are making $18 receive this much for this week or whatever so we can see. You don't have to even give names. I mean, I'm just saying the amounts, the, um, the encampment services, how much of that $1.15 million was spent on encampment services. This is kind of breakdown I think we need to, so we can see how the money is being spent. You've just been allocated 229, how much? Pardon me? 738. Okay. Well, has the city asked you to give them a breakdown from the beginning of money they've been giving you, how it's being spent? Are you just saying it, we spent this and, and we're supposed to guess how much things cost? So. I think the presentation I would like to see and hear about are the different things you're doing. I think you're doing, I'm not saying you're not doing a great job, so I'm not being negative about what you're doing. I think what you're talking about sounds great, but we're allocating money to, for you to do these things. We'd like to see how the money is being spent. At least I would. That's my. And so to, to answer that, if we were to, and I appreciate that that could be and should be and will be what we're going to deliver in some document if you're willing to get it documents, but if you were to look at our contract for this new uh, round of funding that was enacted and uh, or approved on March 28th, the budget, which is in that contract, and it's all a matter of public record, and our, what we spend every week and, and how it gets packaged together so we can sell it easier would be mu much appreciated. We just finally got a financial manager uh, this year in January. It's been really hard to, in a very organic way, keep this thing going um, with a fiscal sponsor that, you know, fiscal sponsors are just fiscal sponsors, unfortunately. I don't want to speak anything other about that. But if you were to look at the budget that we proposed, that the city accepted, which was a, like a compromise, like we, we said, bare bones, this is what we're going to do, was based on bare bones, this is what we did. If it's, if it's $450,000 for, uh, for, for income, for, street, for uh, unhoused imp, uh, salary, uh, hourly work, that's what it is, 445, I think was the number. And, and does that represent a certain percentage? Yeah, that's about 60% if, you were, if we were to do the math quickly. And, it's, and if it's $60,000 or $70,000 for dump fees, that's what Republic Services squeeze out of, squeezes out of this community every single day, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of expenses. When we get tires that get punctured on a daily basis, well, on a weekly basis, we have to repair them, and that's an expense. Is there a lot of trash bags that we buy? These are real solid, quantifiable numbers. When we talk, back, backtracking to that 19 hours average, 
That 19 hours talks about how some individuals are only making those one or two or three hours a week because they're showing up in marginal ways, all the way up to our logistics manager who's then making the most at 23 an hour and putting his, you know, his whole self into it uh, and, and at 40 hours a week. So there's all that range in between. And the average of 19 then says, if, if you were to ask me in the very beginning, I would have said it takes about 15 hours a week for someone to have enough skin in the game to actually start making changes inside so that they can then really perform and show up on the day after they get paid today. They work today, tomorrow they show up. And that is about when we know that people's behaviors are really on board when they're making at least 14, 15, 16 hours a week. And so if they're at 19, that's a very healthy sign. Those who are making very little in money or performing very little are paid very little. And those who show up for 35 hours a week because they're doing that mobile streets team, picking up trash six and a half hours a day, it's because they earned every single one of those hours. And so th that, that's clear math. You can see on a weekly basis how much people made, including myself. So when people make spread rumors about me making all this money, the, the, the record is right in front of us and people pull down those records. No, people have said that many times, many times, and, and uh, understandably so. Um, are you finished, Linda? Did you have any additional questions? Okay, good. All right, Marisol, you're next. And then I think I saw a hand over here. Okay, LaShonda. Oh, Don. Okay, so Maddie and Jamin. Okay, great. And I apologize for those of you I can hardly see on the side. So just uh, wave or something. Thank you. I don't know. Here, she's got one. But, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello, there it goes. Um, thank you, Daniel, thank you so much, all of you. Thank you for spending your time with us and sharing some really incredible, powerful stories. Um, my questions are directed to Daniel in particular. Um, I really agree with Helen and Linda's sentiment. My other ask, as you give us possibly a line item, um, understand how the different job descriptions are broken down, the hours, etc. I wondered if you could also show where the funds for the tiny homes actually were reallocated into. That's, I, there was a, a certain amount of funds that were supposed to go into the safe uh, units or these safe spaces. Um, that was part of this, these objectives right here, this last one, number six. And so those haven't happened in the community. 100% understand the pushback there. Um, I just want to know, were they to increase employees? Beautiful. Were they used to um, do more shower power hours? What were they actually used for and reallocated for? Or were they not actually given to you? That, okay, that's for first one. And your last, that was it. This was not about developing safe living spaces. We were trying to develop them. And if we were to have gotten that scattered sites program, as they called it, for the, in the church parking lots, there would have been an additional chunk of money that might have been put forth by, hopefully, by city administration and, and then uh, affirmed by the city council. We never got to that place, and hopefully we're getting to that. We, the city, are getting to that place now. But that didn't mean that we met every, we didn't meet every week and then every two weeks with city staff and, and uh, our electives about this. So it wasn't part of the original budget. And I can show you the original budget. Okay, thank you. Um, regardless of the budget, I think that the public and when the actual uh, proposal went up, it was a part of that proposal. There was shower powers, there were um, encampment, abatement, specific, you know, hiring, and there was a component to that, and I think that's what we just want transparency and accountability on. So I think that can be made clear. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, the task force is, tends to be held accountable for certain uh, proposals, 
And so we just need to understand what happened and what didn't. The next question that I have, I think it's to everybody. Um, I'm not sure. I love that y'all are taking calls 24 seven. Would love to understand what are those calls? You, you name it, we get it. From, I mean, the suicide call to, I got trash outside of my, on the corner of my house. I mean, there isn't a call that hasn't come into our line. We've had the line for six months now, you know, and every week we're getting more calls. Every week we're getting more calls. So it's really from donations, mental health. Uh, it just, if you can think there was a crisis out there, we've got that call. We've responded to that call. Um, and I'm not saying we are, I'm not someone that, you know, we're not a social worker, but I'm not going to just go, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm not qualified for that. I'm going to do whatever I can in that moment to help you off that ledge, you know, maybe not literally, but, you know, and I'm going to give that mental health, maybe I'll, it'll be a community member that's calling, I mean, two weeks ago, just a random community member that saw our number and said, hey, this was at 10 o'clock at night. You know, I have a little 10 month old daughter sleeping and I still picked that phone up and spent an hour that we wound up through lifelong lifting this person to Kaiser because of a mental health crisis. You know, I mean, so it's really just about any type of crisis, donation, trash pickup. We need water in this encampment. When's your next shower? We take every, and it's not just the encampment calls. It's the situations that we're happening every day that we see driving down everybody's neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. It is much needed and much deserved in our community, and it is something that our task force has been looking at creating for two years, and y'all are already doing it. So um, thank you. The last question is um, outreach. Huge is this building a bridge between housed and unhoused residents. Just trying to understand how that's going. Going, I can walk into the and I walk into the hilltop district, and I get body slammed by the neighborhood council president. Uh, okay, we, we haven't done our work up there yet. We're about to be deepening our work. We should have done it today, but we had other crises that we were going to do. So we're building ourselves neighborhood by neighborhood. When we're in Santa Fe, we're you know that street. You know, if there's a piece of garbage down there, I'm picking it up because it's now easy because it's not a ton of trash because we attended to that area. Now, is there an RV that parks over there because it's a convenient place to park? Oh, absolutely. So do we have a strong relationship with certain neighborhood councils? Oh, yeah. Uh, and do individuals want to join us every day? Well, so, I mean, we've got, we've got community members who we ally with every single, t every minute, I, you know, we're rubbing a shoulder. Like, we are doing that today. So we're creating housed, unhoused relationships just right in this moment. Uh, it just is a matter of building that day by day. Now, do we need someone to nurture that process because it can't be done with a, 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 an FTE that we now have of three management? Oh, absolutely, but we're now just beginning in our second month, well, yeah, at the end of our second month, to now build having that level of support where we can support, where we can have volunteer-based uh, investments. I, I want to say just, I think we're getting a far away with that because of the response we're getting from that hotline of the community members reaching out. I got this donation, I got this bed, I got this, or, you know, so I mean, I think we're making leaps and bounds with that because how much donations come in just from the random person that drove by and said, what do you guys do? You know, because we have an SOS sticker on all of our trucks. So I, I mean, I think we're getting far away with that just from the calls and the amount of calls every week that are building, that is the, the community, and not just the, the person that heard about us, or the, the unhoused person that heard about us, it's the, it's the neighbor. It's the, so I think we're getting a lot ways, you know, and it's building every week, just the amount of donations we get from the community, from just, you know, I mean, 
just this week, I think we got three beds donated or three identified beds that are going into people that, that are in transition in housing. And that all came from a house person that said, hey man, I really like what you guys are doing. How can I help? Osney, please. Um, Don, and then Jamin, and then we'll go to Lashonda. Thank you. <laughs> I guess I've got, first of all, I think we all applaud your success stories. You're doing a great job. And I've got three questions that I'd like to be asked on it. Uh, the first is, when you pay people, in their situation, I'm, I'm betting they don't have, they don't have ready access to, to bank accounts, or, 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 or banks too, for that matter. Uh, do you have a debit card, or you pay them in cash? What's the mechanism that you use for paying them, where they can have actually ac access cash? Yeah, so should, A, do folks need money management support? I'm gonna go that next step. Yes, do we have that, all those systems? No, but from before we got our money through uh, RPF, through the reimagining public safety uh, efforts, we had in our organization the ability to, because we were a smaller scale, to make sure that when someone became employed, they had a bank account with Mechanics Bank and they had direct deposit so that we were, so that they would get it straight into their bank, and they would hopefully begin to model some kind of saving planning process. Now, when we became bigger, because we had to scale up and we got absorbed by another organization, a lot of our systems uh, were not full, full, did not fully develop. They back backtracked for lack of a better word. So can we improve on that? Now that we have a director of operations and we have an administrative systems person, we can now build those back up. And do we need to have better supervision of those folks and better support of those individuals with like services like money management? Yes, that's what we need to build in the coming year. Second question. No, go, go stay up here. <laughs> yes, we're getting far away. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, when you're talking about the expanding your efforts out into El Sobrante, Panol, North Richmond, if there were ever a forensic accounting investigation, could you be able to defend yourself and say that Richmond money is not going to for these other areas outside of Richmond? Yeah, so, I'm oh, sorry, that was loud. Um, like I said, the, the, we have an, ex SOS has not got to expand there. But being that I'm, I'm employed by Lifelong, I'm all West County. So the, uh, my, the outreach, we did, a, we did an event at in Pinot. We did an event at Pinot just last week. Well, it was a health ambassador. You know, it let me stretch out and go, and go service and show the outreach out that way. So it's really not, you know, it's what we would like to do. But as of right now, the outreach that comes from me is able to go West County. You know, so it's not that SOS has got into those different areas, it's that lifelong has allowed me to be able to in those different areas. And then just to add a little uh, to that, the, uh, so obviously our jurisdictional lines are messed up because you go into El Sobrani and we, we put our showers down on, on Richmond land. Now on the left of us is San Pablo, to the right of us is unincorporated El Sobrani. So what happens is there is the political, excuse me, there is the community will to see some activity happening in El Sobrani that has not been yet addressed, that was not yet addressed. So we came in with our showers, our outreach, our trash, and we parked ourselves on Richmond. But the fact of the matter is we're talking to people across those jurisdictions. So because we're responding to El Sobrani's desire, and now Sahela is a really good advocate for that, she got city council to say, not only should you be serving El Sobrane Richmond, but you should be serving El Sobrane Unincorporated, and the city council said yes. So when we expand ourselves from North Richmond 
Shields Reed into unincorporated is because now there, because there was approval 18 months ago. And the same now with El Sobrani. So eventually, we'll have other sources for Pinal. San Pablo desperately needs it. And can we have those jurisdictions putting their money where their mouth is? Yes, we're working on that right now. We are creating strong relationships and uh, with, with, the, with the electeds and the administrators, especially the police in San Pablo and Pinal. We all understand that the city limit lines are arbitrary lines on a map, that, that crime doesn't recognize where city limit lines are, air pollution doesn't, homelessness doesn't. It's, I mean, where I live 200 feet away is San Pablo. Here I'm in Richmond, here I'm in San Pablo. Okay. My third question though, we're hearing a lot of great things from the people you brought here today, but then when we attend our city council meetings under public co comment, this is we're hearing from Jesse Tran, who says something completely opposite. In particular, she says, none of the money is going towards the homeless. What do you have to say about that? Let me give you the example of Darren. Darren, who I was talking with this morning, and who we're, I'm holding his feet to the fire to make sure that when we give him nine hours of work, we're actually getting nine hours of work out of him. But he was someone who was living underneath uh, Central Avenue because... Uh, because he did not get properly housed for whatever reason. Now, Jesse looks at one perspective about all those folks that are living underneath Central Avenue and, uh, and aren't yet housed, but the vast majority are folks who have received at least transitional housing, and now this Richmond Community Foundation funding is going to be prioritized for those folks at Ryden who now need to re-up their transitional or interim housing into something that has more permanence. How are they going to have permanence? Maybe they need to have jobs. There needs to be a sustainable system. We want to participate in that. But the, the fact of the matter is that there's two sides to that, to that equation. Someone who's willing and able in their mind and in their body to be able to walk into housing and stay in it. We, we took two, so we took Darren, who, well, Darren took himself to us and said, I want to get off the streets. And when, and, and I think actually you should speak to this because it was a, it's a very powerful transformation that's happening with this one individual. And then we can speak about Brenda and Hector, who are the other side of that. So, uh, as you said. I just want to do a quick little time check because it's seven o'clock and we had allocated about a half an hour for this presentation. We're now in an hour. We still have people who want to have questions that they want to ask. So my request is that as much as possible that you try to keep your answers brief and to the point so that we can um, have everyone's questions answered and still get to the other items on our agenda this evening. Thank you. So basically, Darren begged we got him into housing, gave him homework every single day. We asked him to do something. He showed up and said, here, I did it. Go to Richmond Works. Here, I did it. Get your ID. Here, I did it. And now he has his own lease. I mean, that's the quick answer to that. You know, and now we're on our second ones, as you said, Brendan Hector. Same situation, old riding people. Now they're in their, their own place, and we've given them homework. They've turned in everything we've asked. We worked with them. Gave, gave Darren a 20-day 20, uh, 20 emergency housing. As long as you do this, you get your own lease. He did this and that, and got a job with us. So that's one way that the money's definitely going to the homeless is, I mean, we went from living in the streets to emergency housing to a job. Did you have any additional questions, Don? Okay, great. Can you tip the mic and pass it to Jamin Purcell, please? This doesn't work. It was working for, it didn't work for you, Marisol? It just worked. All right, so thank you. I will be brief. Uh, so what I'm, one of the things that I'm hearing is that's led to a lot of success has been accountability accountability from people showing up when they say they're going to show up and doing the things that they're going to do. Um, uh, part of that is also, as Helen pointed out, that if things don't work out, being honest about it and being upfront. 
And so the one thing, and, and it's about this presentation, and one thing that about, because uh, I, I, I feel very supportive of the SOS program, but the problem is, is that we need to have accountability of everything, um, from the money to success rates, to, uh, and, and narratives are great, they're, they're part of a larger story, but people want that, uh, that bottom line. And so when I look at the SOS website, I don't see those public documents that you say uh, people should find are freely available, which is true. They are freely available, but you gotta dig for them because the Richmond website is not as navigatable. Um, <laughs> uh, just be kind. Uh, but so if you could pull those and put those on the website, if you could show your production plan, put that on the website and show us some accountability about what the accounts are, which I believe you can get from the fiscal sponsor. I know you got people going like high uh, hours, low hours. We don't need names, we need like title, and that's it, like, and what they're getting paid, and like that they're getting paid. Like, seeing that there's, uh, seeing that they're, where the cash flow is going, really is helpful. And then even having some of those breakdowns of percentages, as you would just try to do, kind of off the top of your head, putting them into like, clean, clear, plain language, would really help to make the public understand how much work you guys are all doing. Like all y'all doing a, a ton of work, but it's really hard to quantify because the end of all of the work is a life continues and improves. And it's like, how do you measure that? Well, this is what the public's looking for, is dollars at the end of the day. And we, um, I think it would help you in, your, in being able to talk about all the success rates that you have had, but I think it would help us so that we can defend how much work you've been doing. And as well, when we have challenges like Republic Services having high costs of being able to dump things, we can address those by bringing those to city council and see if we're, there's other ways we can go about it to be able to reduce your costs and, put, and, and, and figure out other ways to deal with that. Um, so I think that'd be really helpful to us, and um, as well, I would really like to know, yeah, like, just, even, you were talking about you're still working on that solar power, Where, what production schedule? If, if you're running, uh, running across challenges, be open, honest, tell us the challenges, and see how we can move forward. I think that'd be helpful. So my question is, is that possible? Yeah. Thanks. Because we were done, right? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, obviously it's 705. Um, thank you all for your stories. Quick question, yes or no? Were you asked to present a detailed budget here tonight? Yes or no? Right now? No, I mean before this meeting, were you asked that? Thank you. Don't, thank you. Table, have any questions? Yes, go ahead. It's not even a question. I thank you for your stories. I think stories are very powerful. Please sit down. You have been standing for an hour. Even at city council, you would have been sitting down at a panel looking at the city council members. So I apologize for that. I couldn't get in the queue earlier, but thank you. And then before we go to public comments, I have a uh, comment and question. So um, first of all, I want to thank you all for your work. I want to thank you for doing the work that we as society are not doing and for the continual for taking on the continual criticism of not being able to solve a problem that you didn't create and that we as a society have failed to actually solve. The problem of our unsheltered population is not a new one and it's not specific to Richmond or to the Bay Area or even to California. It's a national problem. And you know, I hope that in the future 
when people write about this period, that they write about what it is as a society that has us be okay with walking across people who were sleeping on the streets without a place for basic hygiene. Like what is it that happened to us that had this be something that's so prevalent? So I just want to thank you because I started my work as a harm reductionist working with drug users, establishing needle exchange programs in New York at the height of the AIDS crisis. And similarly, that was a population of people that were marginalized and discarded and stigmatized and ignored and often left to die. So you're doing the work of what it is to be a human being. And I really want to thank you for that. And I want to say that, you know, when I listen into city council meetings that I often hear complaints from local residents about, and it's always the same, we saw this unsheltered person on the street, they're naked, they're aggressive, they're acting in a way that's scary to people, and they want something to be done about it. And I'm saying this in that way because that's often the way it, which it's presented. And what I think that we need to acknowledge is the degree to which untreated mental health populate problems are conflated with the problems of unsheltered people. And whenever people see a person in mental health distress acting out who they believe is unsheltered, whether they are or not, that becomes representative of the entire population in the same way that when people see someone who's overdosed on the street, that becomes representative of all drug users. This is an issue. And so I, I think it's important for us to recognize that, to incorporate that into our outreach, to acknowledge the difficulty that people have, but I also want to say that if anything should remind us of why it's so important for us to develop this community alternative mental health issue, it is this. The fact that we keep hearing this month after month, meeting after meeting, the need is there. The money is there. So I really want to urge us as a group to do everything that we can to not have to rely on SOS having a helpline to do the work that the CCRP should be doing. That's the whole point of it. And if we do it and we're doing it right, then we're gonna help reduce the ways in which as a community, folks to continue to conflate mental health crises with the crises of unsheltered people, which are both crises, but they're different and they require different interventions and different solutions. And so my question to you all, I know that was a long preamble exposition, but I really felt the need to say that because um, like I said, I hear it all the time and I don't think that that's your work. But what it is saying to me, what it is making me think is that in the design for the CCRP, should be some kind of a collaborative work with the organizations like SOS and collaborizing and others that are serving folks in encampments so that when they get calls about things that are happening, that that gets transferred on to this program to also respond so that we're really looking at ways to expand our rapid response in ways that are holistic and actually more broadly serve the community. So my question, and it's almost rhetorical because I'm pretty sure I know the answer, is are you willing to work with us and the team that's designing the uh, CCRP program to figure out ways that you all can collaborate together to help make the program more of a success and also to help educate people in the encampments about the existence of it so that folks will avail themselves of it as a place to call in times of need and distress. So anyway, um, yeah, that's my question. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And now I want to open it up for public comments, which I believe, oh, I'm sorry, I almost forgot about you. I'll be real fast. 
Uh, I was going to say, first, thanks to Misha for that question that diagnosed, I think, some of the different assumptions we had going into the presentation. So I want to own that um, about expecting a fiscal presentation because that was something we'd asked for and we'd had someone from the city report out. So I thought this presentation was a response to that request. So, but I'm owning that if we were on different pages, that explains a lot. Okay, two is what I would like is based on your assessment of where the needs are now and you have some of that in there, I'd like to see in the same way that I'm, I want to see some dollars of how things were spent. I want to see some dreaming with dollars in specifics. For instance, uh, with the CCRP, with the line that you've got going right now, that would be great to be spread across a few different hands than just somebody with a 10 month old. So like, what does that look like in dollars? Like, what do you need to respond to what you're seeing as a giant need right now? Like we need that expertise and we need some, some dollars with it to help accelerate next steps. So can you give us that? Thank you, Helen. Answer, please. Yes. So yes, we're, let's, let, let us do the work that in year two we didn't do in year one as, as far as forward thinking, rather than just following the first step that we needed to take and then the next. And then I just want to follow up on the questions that were asked in terms of whether or not we have a buy-win date for the specific kind of um, breakdown that people were requesting about um, line item expenditures, I guess is pretty much is what I was hearing. If it's that accurate um, summation of what you all were asking for? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I'll, by one date. Maybe we can get back to you on that. Because I, that's a, I mean, do you have a, a good feel for when we can do this by? We, our financial manager is really cool. She'll be able to deliver, and then how we then look programmatically, and there's get, gets to be a little more interesting as we forecast. That's not a financial management so much. It's a program design that we're we're about to have our strategic plan, uh, strategic planning process of the management team in April in uh, in July. So uh, some of the more in-depth stuff maybe we can give you by September. I mean, that's a long way out, so I don't want to do that. So rather than giving you a false answer, I want to get back to you on that. So can we say a buy win date no later than our September meeting? That's Ideally right. Ideally by August. A deal. deal. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so public comments. Does anyone in the public want to make a comment? If so, please raise your hand. Okay. I see the hand of Mr. Don Gosney. Say the word, recognize me. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to be limited. <laughs> no, I mean. Oh, no, we. <laughs> LaShonda does it for I this just, part. yeah, for public okay, comment. Yeah, go ahead. This is more, more of a point. point of order here. Great presentation, slide deck here, but when this meeting gets reported on the city's website, it'll be an audio recording. Okay, they were not gonna be able to see that. None of us have copies of that. Can this be sent out to us right away? Especially for those of us who wanna share all this information tonight, tomorrow, uh, with, the, with the public. Can this be shared with us, please? I'm say the audio recording doesn't take- Pub it, Public comment is not the time for us to be able to respond but I yes for the good of the order for this item for this we will share the slide deck thank you thank you we have no more hands for public comment thank you thank you so much LaShonda so the next item on the agenda is to receive updates from the Community Summit Planning Subgroup and discuss and approve any recommended changes to the Community Summit. So I'm going to turn this over first to Helen and then to Armand, which one of you wants to go first? All right, well, go ahead, Helen. All right. Speaking fast. Um, one, there have not been as many hands planning this as we had hoped or designated. I'm just saying that. 
two. I hope y'all can come. June 3rd, King Elementary, 4022 Florida Avenue. We'd love to have you. June 3rd, Saturday. Um, sorry, I had to say that fast. Uh, three, we currently have very low signups for public attending. I'm just starting there with our conversation too. There's just about 20 people who've actually registered on the Eventbrite, an additional eight or so on Facebook, I believe. Um, we really, really need help getting the word out. And in response to the fact that signups are low and our capacity has been low, there are three, three of us who've been planning it. It's Jamin, Armand, and myself. Um, I am suggesting that we streamline and condense the event. Uh, instead of trying to do five different workshops, I think it needs to be three. We've got great speakers and experts for those three, and I'd love to be able to confirm who here from the task force can be with us on that day. Um, the three are, thank you for us mouthing that question that I could answer, um, youth employment training and safety, poverty reduction strategies, and I believe traffic safety are the three that we've got people who've signed up and are able to be with us. Um, and I might pass it to Armand to give more details. So again, y'all, we need y'all to put the word out. Um, let everybody know, you know, whatever spaces y'all are in, like, hey, this event is coming up. First show of hands, who's able to make it on June 3rd? I'm curious. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I know some of y'all aren't able to make it. So yeah, um, we want y'all to continue to. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, tell your NACC, NACC folks. So for youth employment and training, we have um, Cynthia Hernandez, who's going to come and help be an expert and facilitate that conversation. Um, for um, poverty reduction and strategies, we have Jessica Trevania, who, yes, she's coming, who is the director of the R3F, the Richmond Rapid, Richmond Rapid Relief Fund. <laughs> Spot, something like that, too many R's, uh, who's going to come and facilitate the conversation around uh, poverty reduction, how we can, you know, um, get, you know, the city to to help our folks out, right, in a, in a financial way. Um, and then um, traffic safety, um, Michelle Milam. Okay, so yes, those are the three we've confirmed so far. Um, again, it's only three of us planning this, and yes, we're, we're, we're moving, you know, as best as we could with these three folks. So if other folks want to, you know, jump in, as we've been requesting, um, y'all are welcome to. Uh, so yeah. We're still working on food. Um, we, I've reached out to a few caterers who are also catering events that day, uh, but we're actively searching out folks. I had a idea to, um, Brilliant. huh? Brilliant. Yes, there is this place in El Cerrito, don't know the name of it, but I used to go all the time in high school. <laughs> <laughs> they sell banh mi sandwiches and they're $5 and they're super good. They have all, they have vegetarian options, they have you know, chicken, fish, all that. Only for five dollars, and it's super good. I think Helen has eaten there a few times. Um, so um, that's one of the thoughts. I'm going to call them tomorrow. But we have actively been trying to uh, get those invoices for you, Stephanie. Um, I know you've been asking. Um, so yeah. Anything else, Jamin, Helen? Yes. I want to make sure. I think he was raising his hand to say he would be there, not to oh. speak, was yeah, what no, he was saying. No, I, I am planning to be there, but I was just hoping you get the names of anybody who said, you know, like I did, that I'm going to be there so you know that you can expect me to be there. Right. What I can do, too, I'll send out a, like, group of dogs to see amongst us to see who can, no? We can't. Brown, we can't. Sorry, that's why I was. 
So yes, you sh we should write down their names here now from the people who raised their hand. I'm, I'm okay, they can send it. Yes, you, you can. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the proposal that I think we need to discuss slash approve is about streamlining to those three. We did send out a lot of other invites uh, to other people, trying to get people in, um, but we did not get anyone for the other spaces at this time. I think the timeline was also t a little ambitious in reflection. I'm owning that. Uh, and I think that we will shorten the day we will not go as long as 2 p.m. by focusing on um, three workshops. So we can amend the Eventbrite, but I know that was a concern for some people as well, was being able to be there for the full time. So that was a proposal that I had um, for everyone. So we still have, if it's three 45 minute sessions with transition time between them, that's three hours plus time to eat. And for an opening, I think all we need max is four hours if you followed my math in that moment. And I heard you second that, Jamin. Yeah. Okay. So discussion of this motion. So it's a motion to reduce the time of the day, to, re to eliminate two of the sessions, I understand, harm reduction and police policies and practices. Is that correct? Okay, I see your hand, uh, Marisol. I just wanted to better understand um, the room allocation, asking people to go into specific rooms and what that commitment or facilitation or the need was. Hello? Oh, I didn't um, So we'll, our goal was to have an expert allocated to each room as well as the task force, member of the task force to be in, help facilitate the conversation, take notes so that we can report back uh, the findings of that um, room. Does that make sense? Yes. A second question then? Um, is you're kind of alluding it to it, but will those task force members come back and will they be put on an agenda in June so that they can report back on what was said and the findings that you just mentioned? Good question. We haven't um, discussed that far on. But I think they so we're the committee putting on, putting together the event not necessarily what the outcome uh, of that. So we will present that, but what do we want to do with that? Well, that's up to the fullness of the task force, to be clear. Um, it's not upon just the three of us, so yes. Can I request that we put that on the agenda, please, for the June meeting presentations or debriefs, however, from each of those respective groups? Um, and then the other just quick question was language accessibility, wheelchair accessibility. Um, it's King all. Elementary. Yes, um, it's completely wheelchair accessible. Um, we'll only be using first floor rooms. There are no stairs uh, needed for exits. It's all ADA compliant. Um, the entrance point that we're We'll have two entrances because I think people will probably find the front office better, even though the program is starting in the cafeteria and that's more of the hubs. So part of what I was going to say, in addition to people helping in the rooms, I have some community members that can help me, but it'd also be great to have a task force person help at each of those spaces as part of the greeting, because I imagine people will come at different times, help them know the layout, where things are. That'd be great. All right, uh, I'm a little confused, so maybe you can help unconfuse me. Are, is this going to be one big event or is it going to be a multiple events happening at the same time? This is going to be 
a gathering for an introduction, this is what today's about, and then splitting into breakout rooms for smaller conversations, people rotating between those rooms. So the participants, the public, will have to decide which issue is most important to them to attend because they can't be in three places at the same time or five places. It's, it's three breakout sessions. So you pick where you want to go the first one, where you want to go the second time, where you want to go the third time. Each, each session will be offered every breakout. Okay, but something, let's say I'm in room A. Mm -hmm. Thank you, okay. I'm in room A. Okay, for the, for the first session, but there's something really great being discussed in room B, for, no, at the same time. But then when I go into room B for the second session, that's not even being discussed anymore, so I've missed out on that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, my, that's my concern, is that when you're having multiple meetings going on at the same time, it's, they're not all identical. You know, from session to session to session. And, and so people are going to be missing out on that kind of thing. And it makes it also a little bit more difficult to report on it afterwards. I disagree that it makes it more difficult to report on afterwards. Um, I think part of the techniques is, is I've run similar events a lot. And part of the techniques is actually you have running notes so that people can see what was discussed in the previous one. You do that projected by having your notes projected that have been going from previous ones. There's also, um, you can have it on paper if people prefer that. I do think that what's important about having the smaller groups is the depth of conversation you're able to have when the groups are smaller. I think the converse option, which would be to do one time, everybody together talks about one thing, the next, and then the next, is you get less airtime, um, and so you get less multitude of perspectives. Sorry. So it's a trade-off. It's always a trade-off, but that's why we designed it that way. I second it, Linda Whitmore. Okay, let's call the question, please. All right, Steve Bischoff. Aye. Helen Burks. Aye. Marisol Cantu. Aye. Luis Chacon. No. Don Gosney. No. Kirsten Killian Lobos. Yeah. Uh, Armand Lee. I guess. <laughs> yes. Yes? Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, Leah Murray. Yes. Jamin Purcell, yes. Deborah Small, yes. Ben Terrio, yes. uh, Tamisha Walker, no. Linda Whitmore, yes. B.K. Williams. Yes. Um, a motion passes. Oh, can I? Sorry, okay. I'm <laughs> I got sorry. Hold on. Don, will you complete? No, where are you? Do I go on? Okay. No, I just wanted just to, if I could amend the timeline to come back to us. There's only three of you, maybe five or six, you need to get together, find a time to meet, and get your report together, and then come back to us. I would say July presentation, but it's up to the committee. I'm not on that committee. You do what you got to do, but instead of rushing you to meet in two weeks and come back to us to report, you might want to come back in July to give you time to get it together, information, present it, and then come and report to us without having that rushed feeling. But it's up to you. Just my recommendation, wait until July for the report to the task force. I'd like to recommend I'm supposed to be next, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry. I'd like to recommend a restructuring of this thing. I think, I don't know how many people you guys are talking about all told, but it doesn't sound like very many. And if that's really true, I think we ought to do general, you know, sessions on subjects, but do them all together. Because otherwise it's going to be kind of silly. If you have five people sitting in a room talking about whatever it is, that isn't going to really do it, I don't think. So anyway, that's, that's what I'm suggesting.
Um, I would like to see what our signups look like closer to the event, but I definitely understand what you're saying, which I think is the same concern that Ben that Don was raising. Um, sorry, single syllable names, nothing alike. Um, and so uh, I, I hear what you're saying in the intent, but I'm wondering if we can get the numbers higher. I, I don't want to not hear from people who take the time and commitment to be there. I know our folks, and I don't RSVP, so I, I wonder how many people will are, will still come and not RSVP. That's my only concern, just, you know, being real and honest about that. Um, so, yeah, I think Jamie. No, I got the mic. I'm oh. Not that one. Okay, good. Um, yeah. Okay, I don't, yeah. So I would make the uh, friendly amendment to that, would, would be if we have a certain capacity we continued the three round, the three different rooms, and if we are under that capacity, we do a larger shared room. I think that would be the best compromise, and it would kind of address the Don's issue. But I think that to the Don's point, I think the way we had already discussed doing it was yes, an ongoing conversation. You might not be in that room with that person making that great point, but we will have it displayed. So that way then we can maybe bring it back to catch every, and, and at the beginning of every session it's gonna be the expert frames, we recap, and then they go. So that was the general like kind of layout that we were gonna have. And we were as well gonna have some materials to kind of give people a framing again of each of these discussions. I hope that helps. So, so I would amend them that it would be capacity, single, or Triple. So um, I want to provide a little clarity, okay, before we actually move to voting. As I understand, the original motion was to change the overall time of the event and to shorten it so that it would go from 9 to 12, I think, instead of 9 to to nine to two, or do you want to do uh, ten to nine to one? Okay, so nine to one instead of nine to two, and that you're um, eliminating two of the topics you won't be covering: police policies and practices, and harm reduction and overdose prevention. Those two topics won't be covered. The other three, um, that's the that was the first part of the. Um, motion as I recall. Then the amendment was around whether or not you would continue to have three separate breakout sessions um, that would repeat three times um, that were each 45 minutes or if you would have one large session that everyone was in. And that was the concern that Don and Steve made. And so Jamin's amendment or suggestion was a capacity one that um, because you think more people will come and so the idea was that if capacity reached a certain amount then you would keep the format that you had and if it was below that you would make the adjustment that was recommended and so my one additional suggestion is that you should have the capacity number somewhere between 50 and 60 as the one at which you would uh, go to the original format, and below that you would keep people in one large room. Is that acceptable? How about 55? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So, now is everyone clear on what we're voting on now? Or should, do I have to repeat it again? I'm not sure I could do it. Yes. <laughs> So my question is, the modification will happen the day of? Okay. Right. So are people ready to vote? Is there any additional discussion? Yes, go ahead, Linda. No, that's not part of that motion. No, that was a total separate conversation. I don't want to mix up the motion. Okay, sorry. I don't want to, I'm just trying to like 
keep us focused. Okay. So I asked the question again. LaShonda, is there something you wanted to say? Oh, okay. Are we ready to vote? Is there any objections to me calling the question? We have not done public comment. Oh, but thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Anyone from the public, sorry. I'm sorry. Would anyone from the public like to make a public comment? If so, please raise your hand. You, okay. All right, there's no public comment on this item. Thank you. Okay, uh, Steve Bisha? Aye. Helen Burks? Aye. Maricel Cantu? Aye. Don Gosney? No vote. Abstention? No vote. I'm not sure. I'm not voting, I'm curious. Okay, abstention? Okay, Kristen Killian Lowell? Yes. Armand Lee? Yes. Leah Murray? Yes. Jamin Purcell? Yes. Uh, Deborah Small? Yes. Ben Terrio? Yes. Tamisha Walker? Oh, uh, sorry, she's not here anymore. Uh, okay, Linda Whitmore? Yes. And BK Williams? Yes. Give me one second. Okay, the motion passes 12 ayes. One abstention and um, six people absent. And one no vote. Okay. Can you repeat that again, please? Sorry, so we have 11 ayes, one no vote, um, and six members absent. Okay, got it. All right, so thank you everybody very much. This meeting is adjourned. Everyone have a great holiday. And uh, please, if you have the opportunity, sign up and spend some time and support the Community Summit. Yes. Is Randy missing anybody?